welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Everybody, uh, this is Barney Leventino. Welcome to Turn the Page, the podcast of Syosset Library. And I'm happy today to welcome uh, Jeffrey Wilson and Brian Andrews, uh, author of their latest book, Dark Intercept, which was just released, uh, I think, on September 7. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thanks for having us. Great to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, so tell us a little bit about Dark Intercept, because it's a little bit... Um, outside the typical genre, but let's let's talk a little bit about the book and then we'll get into some specifics. Sure, yeah, it's actually, it's funny that you say that um, because it's something Brian and I've been talking about a lot lately. You know, it is, it is definitely a little bit of a departure in some ways from what we've done in Tier 1 and Sons of Valor and the Writing the Presidential Agent books with the Webb Griffin Estate. Um, but it's funny because when we set out to do that, we didn't really feel that. We didn't, we didn't think of it that way. You know, instead of thinking of it as a turn into another subgenre. It really felt more like just sort of adding one more layer, if you will. You know, Brian and I pride ourselves on being very character-driven novelists. Our, our, our books are definitely informed by re- the relationships and stuff like that. So when we set out to do this, this series, The Shepherds, what we really were doing was just adding a layer, uh, this spiritual layer, this faith layer, which is, you know, of course, a very common, if not universal, uh, aspect of the human existence. We all ask these questions. We come to different answers, perhaps, but we all ask these questions about, is there a God? What is God? Why am I here? You know, those sorts of things. And so when we set out to do it, it was really more adding that layer than feeling like we were departing into another subgenre. You agree with that, Brian? Yeah, I think that's a good characterization of what we were trying to do. And I love that layering metaphor that Jeff used because, you know, we talk about that a lot in the other series that the intelligence community and covert operations is sort of like an onion and, and you peel back the layers and you, every time you peel back a layer, you find something new. And so, you know, Jedediah Johnson's journey as the protagonist in this story is him sort of always having been aware that there was something else going on, something behind the scenes, but he never could really quite see it. You know, he felt it, but he he didn't have access to it. And the first book in this series, Dark Intercept, is really the story about him, you know, finding the courage to sort of peel back that layer and see, you know, what's the next thing out there and, you know, what's going on uh, that I always felt but really could never, could never see. You know, at, at one point um, on, on that same line, uh, I think Rachel, his, um, his old flame from uh, back in his high school days, talks about um, his light coming back. And I guess it's, it's, it's almost that, that same thing, his reawakening and, and, and reconnecting with, with what he once had and kind of lost a little bit along the way. So that was an interesting little bit of, of his personal journey. Yeah, and a little bit different too, right, from, from a, uh, as a writer or a reader, you sort of have expectations of what your protagonist is, right? And this hero's journey. And, you know, in, in Tier 1, for example, the, our character John Dempsey, he pretty much epitomizes that action thriller hero. Whereas in Jedediah, we have a character who is, you know, really, uh, Brian likes to say at the very beginning of this book, he is as broken as you can get and still be a hero. He's broken physically. He's broken emotionally because he's leaving his team. And he's been broken spiritually and, and running from that uh, for so many years. So the idea of having a, an, an action hero whose backstory is that he's run from his problems and ended up in the SEAL teams is a little bit different. And we, we had to tread a little bit lightly in how we treated, you know, sort of the expectation of a hero's journey uh, in crafting him. As I was reading it, I was thinking about the um, dozens, hundreds, I don't even how many we have on the shelves here of the, uh, you know, your action thriller uh, book. And um, in a lot of ways here, you guys are really cutting out the middleman and not to give too much of the story away, but you're going straight to the, the heart of the battle against good and evil. 
and and it, you know it's really an interesting take on it and, and, and a neat way of, of, of getting into it yeah we like to sort of play around with this idea that you know what if you know all the bad stuff that happens out there isn't entirely just happening at random you know what if good and evil, you know, is playing a role in sort of moving chess pieces on the board. And that's kind of the premise of this book is that, you know, we all are confronted with certain situations and choices in our lives. And, you know, there's maybe an invisible hand trying to push us one way or the other. And, you know, we have to find that inner courage and that inner purpose, I think, to resist those those nudges, right? Especially if the nudges are trying to do, you know, push us in a direction that make us weaker or, or, or trying to get us to do things that go against our moral compass. Yeah. Um, you guys, it's an interesting collaboration here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your, your own personal histories. You have a, a nuclear engineer, a submarine officer who's made degrees from Vanderbilt and Cornell, um, a vascular surgeon who also, uh, had a couple of side gigs as a jet pilot and a <laughs> instructor, just a couple of average Joes. Um, <laughs> how did you guys come to collaborate, not just on this series, but, but the prior ones, the tier one and the Sons of Valor series? How did it all come together for you guys? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's actually kind of an interesting story because, um, you know, and it's a great way to give a sh shout out to the, to the thriller community for an organization that we love and cherish, which is International Thriller Writers. Uh, and the annual Thriller Fest, because that's where Brian and I met. So Brian and I were already writing independently. He had a, I think, um, year we met, he had a book out and one coming, and I had two out and a third coming. And um, we met at Thriller Fest and became fast friends with no ulterior motive of, of maybe one day writing series together. Uh, we just became friends because we shared this military background and uh, there's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of uh, military veterans now in this space. You know, our friends Josh Hood and uh, uh, Tony Tata, who is writing great books, and uh, um, Don Bentley, gosh, writing writing in the Jack Ryan Jr. So there's a I lot of veterans. Don, I so, spoke with Don Bentley a couple of months ago also. Yeah. He's a great, great guy and a good friend of ours. But he, uh, so there's a lot of us, and that was sort of how we connected. The collaboration came later. We formed a friendship first based on our shared experience and, and, our, and our values and families and stuff like that. And later, uh, Brian, it was actually Brian's idea to um, try to collaborate, you know, with his background in, in uh, submarines and me having served with the SEAL teams uh, as a combat surgeon. He was like, you know, you know about this world. I know about that world. What if we combined them and work together? And and quite honestly, uh, I'm ashamed to say that I was the, the resisting force. I was the one that was like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't, I'd been writing my whole life as I can't imagine what that looks like to write together. Um, but Brian, being Brian, wore me down, manipulated me with his psychology degree. And, uh, and eventually we gave it a shot and, and the rest is history. I, to be honest, looking now, I don't know what I was so worried about um, because I can't even imagine going back to writing by myself, which is, is, um, you know, sad in some ways, because I loved it. <laughs> but I love this. I love this so much more. It's just so much better. And uh, this partnership has obviously been financially very lucrative for us. But it's also just been personally very satisfying. I get to work with my best friend, we get to collaborate and be creative together. We never have writer's block, like it's just been fantastic. No, you yeah, yeah mentioning their, your, your process, and I, I know we'll go a little further into that. Every writer has their own um, unique and individual um, process and approach to writing. And um, I would imagine that uh, in a collaborative effort, um, those individual quirks or those individual uh, methods um, might become, I'll use exacerbated um, <laughs> differences uh, might become a little bit more pronounced. And how do you guys work that, um, your, your, your each, your uniqueness into a, a, a single meshed product? So I think when, you know, Jeff was answering the last question, sort of how did this all get started? You know, he mentioned our Navy ethos. And I think that's, you know, something that is very important to talk about and, and, and how we guide this process of co-authoring. You know, in the military, on these 
high functioning teams, you know, whether you're, you know, on a submarine or you're with the Navy SEALs out deploying at the tip of the spear in combat, what you quickly realize is, you know, no one person can do that job by themselves. You know, you can't just hop on a nuclear submarine and do every single watch station, do everything by yourself. It's impossible. It's a team. And everybody brings their strengths and weaknesses and experiences. You were talking about our diverse backgrounds. That's one of the things we leverage in this partnership is because we come at this with a, hey, mission before self, team before self attitude with our diverse backgrounds, it really sets us up to sort of augment each other's weaknesses and put our strengths forward. So we quickly sort of came to this idea that, hey, you know what, when we tell a story, it's going to be an Andrews and Wilson story. It's not a Jeff story. It's not a Brian story. It's our story together. So one of the really cool things, and some people don't believe us when we say this, but this is the truth, is that Jeff has free reign to edit anything that I write and vice versa. And we're writing the book simultaneously. So we write multi uh, point of view, third person character driven stories and we divide up the chapters by point of view so Jeff's writing one character you know maybe he's writing chapters one three five ten I'm writing the others but we each get to take a turn in the different characters head spaces and what that does at the end of the day the fact that he can edit my work I can edit his and we're, we're all writing the different characters is that you get this one unique voice that sort of goes all the way through the book and that's an Andrews and Wilson voice and one of the best compliments that we get is when we see a review or we're talking to somebody like yourself who's read the book and interviewing us, and they say, you know what? It just seemed like one person all the way through. That's a real tribute to sort of our method, and, and we're very proud of that. That leads me to another question I was about to ask, and that it's that I, I find that obviously every character in a book has some of of the author in them. And I was going to ask you which one of you is more Jedediah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm guessing that you're going to say you both are. Yes, we, we both are. And the other thing is, I think that um, because we have so uh, much background to draw on, um, so many people that we've served with, that we've uh, admired and, and um, you know, been proud to be part of their team, these characters are not just part of us, but they're actually part of our whole experience. And so I like to think of the characters as almost an amalgam of the people that we've served with, the men and women that we've served with over the years. And, and we take that actually very seriously. We want these characters that we create to reflect the ethos, like Brian was talking about, the moral compass of the people that we served with, and be an accurate and inspiring reflection of those people that we've been so proud to be associated with. And so we do see, I suppose, a bit of ourselves in, in all of the characters, but I see tons of other people also that we've known over the years in each of these characters. I'm curious as to who those other people are that uh, form an amalgam of Victor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Well, we all have that guy too. Maybe not to that nearly that extent, but <laughs> um, two of the most significant characters in this story are teenage girls. You have Sarah Beth and you have Corbin. And, and um, how do you come to really create them and to focus um, your story on them? I mean, they, they are integral to the, to the story and, and, and to the, where I think the whole series is going to ultimately head. And, and, and they're interesting characters, and it's just a, a neat way of, of, of um, again, changing the dynamic a little bit of the typical uh, thriller story. So first of all, thank you for bringing, noticing that and bringing up the question. Um, it resonates with us because both of us are fathers and we both actually have 13-year-old uh, daughters. When we wrote this book, they're both 12-year-old daughters. So they're heavily modeled after, you know, our own experience with being fathers and being around, you know, teenage girls. And I think, number one, we tapped into this part of every father, which is, you know, your worst fear, your worst nightmare is that your little girl is taken and there's nothing you can do about it. So from David's standpoint, you know, this is just mortifying. You know, he's powerless to do anything about it. And he has to call upon the one person who is kind of the last person in the world he was asked for help. But from, you know, what you're talking about, getting into Sarah Beth and, and the fact that she has a point of view, you know, this was us sort of really 
working, you know, dialoguing, talking with our daughters and trying to imbue Sarah Bath with the characteristics that, you know, the, the best of what we see in our daughters. Wouldn't you agree, Jeff? Oh, I agree with that completely. And, and, and in fact, I think it's even worth an actual shout out to our daughters, Larkin and Emma, because not only were they inspiration for these characters, but they actually came beside us and helped out. Like they actually, you know, we would sit down with them when we wrote a chapter from Sarah Beth's point of view and say, all right, what, what's wrong with this? And they'd be like, oh, we would never say that, or we don't play, we're too old for that game or this song or whatever. So they, I think, I hope had fun, but for sure they were involved, not involved enough to get royalties, by the way. I've already made that very, <laughs> had that conversation with Emma already, but, but just involved enough to hopefully have fun. But yeah, no, I agree. Being dads, but also having creative daughters who could come, come beside us and, and actually give us some input. It made it fun. It was like a family project. Well, it had to be a huge change of pace for you from, you know, writing, uh, you know, Navy SEAL operators to then switching gears into, a, you know, a 13 year old girl. It, 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 was, it was tough. It was and tough. I think, you know, one of the other things about these characters, you know, thematically, that's important to sort of mention is that, you know, it was very intentional that we wanted to have these watchers be children because you know we see it in our own kids you, you, there is there is sort of this innocence and naivety but also at the same time a very astute perceptiveness in children you know I, i'll never forget you know I, I was with my daughters and we were interacting with a particular gentleman who was unpleasant but you know when we when we left my, one of my youngest daughters said he's not a very nice man is he and I said, no, I, I don't think that he is. And I think, you know, they they see through the act, they can see through the mask and they can really hone in on, you know, what's in somebody's soul. And I think as adults, we sometimes start to lose that ability over time. We might, we sort of buy the snake oil salesman's routine because we're, we're wanting to, the pun, a part of us wants to. And so the watchers are children in this series very intentionally, you know, they have this great power and this great responsibility, but they're also extremely vulnerable. And that's why this pairing of the shepherds and the watchers we find so interesting. We hope that the readers do too. Yeah, it was really, as I said, a, a, a totally different kind of take and a different type of character than you would typically uh, in, encounter in, in, in a Navy SEAL story. So it was kind of <laughs> neat. Um, this, this book is um, infused in a lot of ways, and I'm going to go in two different directions here with, with um, faith and spirituality are, are, are um, significant elements here. And I'm going to, before we get into the substance of that, I'm noticing that the character names that you selected all kind of resonate with some sort of biblical um, uh, ramifications. You have Jedediah, you have Sarah. You have Rachel, you have David, you have Benjamin, um, even the school that you talk about in St. George's. Um, so there's kind of a, a foreshadowing there in, in, in the names of the characters in terms of where they are and, and what their direction is. I'm, I'm guessing that this was not a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we did put some thought into the characters' names and um, certainly these characters are at times metaphors for biblical figures and, and uh, themes within, within scripture. Um, but we didn't want to be heavy handed about it. You know what I mean? We didn't want to, at no point do we want to lose what we do, which is just tell exciting stories. Um, yes, we wanted to have this faith element. You, you know, you've mentioned the ideas of, of faith and spiritual warfare and crisis and faith. Those are part of the human experience and part of this story. But we didn't want it to be a heavy handed, preachy book. And so we tried to do exactly what it's really cool that you picked up on that. We tried to do exactly what you said and, and pick these names with some reference that the savvy reader will pick up on and say, oh, I bet that character's going in this direction or that direction just based on the name. So it's very cool that, uh, that you picked up on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For <laughs> that. It's, it, the whole take was kind of interesting. And, and um, you also just touched on now, I'm going to get back to my, my, my note about um, faith and spirituality as being a uh, really a driving force in the book. And um, from what I've read um, of your bios also, I, I, I think that it, it, it plays a role in your lives. And 
as authors um, telling this story, again, without becoming preachy and without becoming um, proselytizing in any shape, manner, or form, uh, that's got to be a fine line to um, make the story work without, as you say, become heavy-handed and, and, and preachy. So how did you guys work that one out? Well, Jed, you, or, or Jeff, do you want to take this with respect to Jed, or do you want... Yeah, so I think I the, the key is the heavy handedness, right? And I will tell you, I want to I want to give another shout out, and that is to the amazing team at Tyndale House. So this is the first book that we have published with a faith based publisher, and they're of course one of the largest in the world. And what's interesting, this is the insight that I want to share. There were times when during the editorial process, they came to us and they were like, "Oh, you got to pull that back a little bit." You're, you're overdoing this element or you're over teaching it. Um, and so I think that this is no different to us than almost any of the other aspects of the other books we've written, whether you're going to talk about relationships or you're going to talk about um, regret or, you know, grief or any of these things there. It's really easy, especially in a thriller, as you as you keyed into to go too far and kind of ruin the book. We, our experience has been that the average reader loves to learn, but boy, do they hate to be taught. They don't want to feel like your narrative is teaching them, or in this case, preaching to them. They like to share an experience with the characters like Jedediah, and through that, if they learn a little something or it gives them something to think about, then they're great with that. But the moment they feel like that's the author writing that dialogue to tell me something, they reject it. And I know I'm like that as a reader also. And so our editors were fantastic at saying, look, during this scene, during this conversation, he's telling him too much. He wouldn't really say all that. He just, just have him say what he would say to the character. And if then there's more to fill in, the, your readers are smart and they can fill in the gaps. And so I think as a writer, that's how you find that balance uh, of those spiritual elements is to just make it as realistic in the human interaction as it would be. It's not something that you have a 20 minute conversation on. Maybe it's just a throwaway sentence that makes someone think a little bit, uh, it, the characters I mean. So that it is a balancing act, you're absolutely right. But I think that that's the technique that they taught us to find the balance. And, and I think just to add one little twist to that, you know, we talked, you know, uh, Jeff mentioned the hero's journey. And with Jed, you know, part of his journey is this, element of crisis in faith. So, you know, he's not going around asking everybody, you know, he's not walking up to strangers, you know, well, what should I think? Well, I'm struggling with this. That's, it's very internal. And, and as we go through the book, you know, first he has to reckon, he doesn't even recognize that he has a crisis in faith, right? So part of it is the first third of the book is him just, you know, I'm retiring, I've lost my purpose, now I have to do this job to help these people that I really don't want to interact with. And, you know, there's something else going on here. And, and it's, I think as the reader, you know, if we did our job right, you're going along with Jed on this journey. And the questions that he's asking of himself, hopefully sort of feel naturally like they're, they're unfolding at the same rate that you would ask them you, yourself if you were in Jed's point of view. So like Jeff said, we're not trying to slam it in your face. You, you're you just experiencing it with the hero. Yeah, Jed, Jed's journey, um, it, it works. I mean, the whole, the whole homecoming metaphor for him, um, literally coming home physically. And also, uh, again, we talked back, um, Rachel mentioned his light, which, which we had seen in the scene way back in high school in the basement where he, he it manifested itself and then he kind of rediscovers that so yeah it really is um a literal um physical and and spiritual homecoming for him it was interesting to watch how that developed within himself and he's kind of coming around to recognizing that um mm -hmm. so that was kind of neat and a success if the reader sees it before jed right like jed is this door kicking 220 pound Navy SEAL who is not the most self-aware guy in the world. And so I feel like um, we did our job well if the reader sort of sees that connection before Jed does, right? And, mm -hmm. and hopefully that's what we did. You did, you did, you did a nice job on that. <laughs> um, so 
clearly, uh, this is book one in the series. And um, when can we anticipate the next installment? So one of the things we're really excited about is the publication cycle. Um, so we worked really hard to write th the first three books in the series quickly. And uh, so book two comes out in April called wow. Dark Angel. And book three will follow uh, next fall. So within a 13 month period, it's gonna be bam, bam, bam. Uh, people will be able to binge uh, this series. And Jeff, should we share the other fun, exciting news? Yeah, absolutely, go for it. It's your turn, I think I did it. Okay, so the other exciting news is that uh, the series has been optioned for television. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to that. It's very early, but thing the wheels seem to be turning. And so hopefully, um, not not too long, we'll get to see Jed, you know, either on a streaming service or one of the networks. That's terrific. I will look forward to that as well. Um, before we wrap up, and again, not to um, potentially spoil plots going forward, um, but as a reader, I got to tell you, I was a little, and I, 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 I'm unsatisfied with the description of David's whereabouts during the climactic battle towards the end of the book. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe we might learn a little bit more about what was going on with David during all of that as we go forward. Or I may be completely off the mark and reading way too much into this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to David's journey coming also. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I kind of had a hunch and I'm looking forward to seeing where he goes and where the whole story goes. Um, it's an interesting series. Um, the book is terrific. It is called Dark Intercept by uh, Jeffrey Wilson, Brian Andrews. You guys bill yourselves as Andrews and Wilson. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next installments. I'm looking forward to the series when it comes out. And uh, I will, I have not been familiar with, but I'm going to head back and, and, and look into the tier one series as well, because it sounds like it's interesting. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you and looking forward to what's coming down the road. Thanks so much. We enjoyed it a lot. Yep. Thank you, Brian. And with that, we will turn the page on this chapter of the Syosset Library podcast. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode. Thank you.